What is going on, guys? It is Chris here, and uh, this is going to be Profits Management Part 2, a guide I didn't even know I was going to have to do, but I uh, guess I've gotten a lot of requests for this. It's probably my second most requested guide to do. Uh, I'm going to go over some different stuff today, so don't expect it to be exactly the same, but I'm going to go over some of the more fine-tuned uh, questions that you guys have given me. Uh, before I get started into what uh, different buildings we have, though, I'm going to go ahead and go over... Um, I had a quick question about what kind of starting strategies um, I usually go for. Uh, do I usually build my economy first? Do I usually just go right for my military? What exactly do I do? So, in uh, Rome 2, I changed up my strategy a little bit. Usually, I'm a little bit more kind of cautious. Um, I like to build up a little bit of my economy because that way I can just start going to town. But this game really does seem like you have to strike a balance. I know in Shogun 2, I went down almost all of my economic tree. Like, I probably went for six or seven different researches before I even bothered to go down any of my military trees. So, that's just how I like to play. But um, I played as Pontus this time around. And so, I decided what I was going to do is because I started at war with these, uh, a guy, a country that owned these two provinces, or sorry, these two regions in the beginning. I just I decided that I have military and I'm going to use it and I just I rather take out these guys especially on harder difficulties. Um, it's going to be a lot easier if you can just take out your enemies right away. At least in my opinion, usually it is. If you can win the battles, then not only do you not have to worry about somebody harassing you later with stronger armies, uh, but you can also take them out uh, probably with less diplomatic cost, and then you also have the bonuses of the income you get from their regions. So that's just kind of my strategy. I usually do that kind of stuff. I usually will try, if I, I'm already at war, to just kind of get rid of them right away. But if I'm at peace, then maybe I'll build a little bit. just really depends on what my diplomatic outlook is, especially my difficulty. That really does change a lot. But um, So that kind of summarizes a quick question that somebody had for me. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and jump right into what buildings we're going to look at today. This is a question a lot of you guys have been having about what's the difference between all these different buildings, um, why should you invest in certain ones over others, and just kind of like understanding exactly how to build your provinces. So um, there's several different kinds of buildings. There's only two that I'm not going to really touch on. Uh, the two I'm not going to touch on are sanitation and ports. Um, sanitation is kind of straightforward. It helps reduce squalor. It increases growth, increases public order, and that kind of stuff. Um, and they're a little bit more advanced down the tech tree, um, so I don't want to really go into that because I want to try to keep these as like kind of like beginner guides, and you guys can just figure it out once you run into them. Um, and then I'm also not gonna really bother going over ports because it's kind of self-explanatory. These are ports; they are next to any you know settlement that is next to an ocean, and they have different benefits. I mean, these are basically the same benefits that you get from all the other buildings, so I don't really feel like I need to go over them per se. Um, so what I am going to go over though is I'm going to go over agriculture buildings, capital buildings, uh, city center buildings, military buildings, and religious buildings. So um, starting off, we're going to go ahead and go over agriculture buildings, and this is kind of um, its own subcategory um, in a sense um, than all the other buildings. This is kind of the counter to uh, the rest of the buildings because a lot of the other buildings, when you upgrade them to a certain point, they'll start requiring you to... Um, have extra food and this is how you're going to get them. You're going to get extra food through your agriculture buildings. So the downside to um, agriculture buildings is that a lot of times they're going to produce squalor. So even though this building gives me plus to wealth and plus to food and replenishment, it also gives me minus four to squalor, which is an issue that you guys have been having, but I'm going to summarize that um, after I'm done with the buildings. And um, But if you don't know um, about food, your food is right down here. Um, you get you know plus to your growth rate and then you get plus to your unit replenishment. Unit replenishment is just any time you have damaged units within your territory, um, you're going to have certain bonuses. Now, this is a faction-wide one, that what's listed here on their food panel. Um, but you also have specific ones, I believe, yes. Uh, if you have certain ones for just um, within the certain territory. So within this region, I'll get also plus two replenishment um, and plus four replenishment within this other region here. So that's just kind of how you understand your replenishment. But growth rate is a little bit more important. Um, you see this little number here whenever you click on uh, a province of some kind. This is your province's population surplus, and this is your growth of that population surplus. Um, you notice it says growth required for population surplus. That is basically once you hit that certain um, certain amount, then you'll get one more point here. And that's what answers um, this number here. So if I want to upgrade this uh, settlement here, 
provincial capital here, I need five population surplus, and I only have three, so I have to wait a couple turns, and then I'll get it. So that kind of understands um, growth, and that is um, sped up by getting bonus in food, and then I think there's some research that you can do, and a couple other things, but again, that's like your biggest bonus is probably going to be in food um, and general security. Um, the next kind of buildings we have are capital buildings, and these ones are um, a little bit different depending on exactly where they are placed. Um, it's like Captain Kirk, exactly uh, where they are placed. Anyways, <laughs> uh, but so if you have uh, if they're placed in provincial capitals, they're going to give you greater bonuses. So this one you can see gives me bonuses to research rate and. Uh, wealth and influence and also stuff but if I go to here this one produces uh, this specific region um, has a rare resource of wine and so this one will help um, me give me more uh, surplus of wine which allows me to export more of it which increases my trade income so as long as I'm trading with other nations this is going to be a beneficial thing for me and you'll notice it also gives me research rate and growth per turn um, and some public order per turn and stuff like that um, and then any of the other regions that don't have a specific resource but uh, have capital buildings they're going to be called market and again they're going to have the the same benefits but these are also going to be where you find the majority of your garrison coming from is probably going to be from uh, these capital buildings so the next kind of building that we have are city center buildings now these can range from coliseum to slave markets to um, the library here we have a bunch of different stuff that you can do there's a whole bunch of trees it also depends on what faction you are and so I went for the library here because I wanted my dignitary agent and so this one gives me plus to research rate and plus to um, wealth. But then again, you'll see here that again, if I upgrade this, it's going to minus into my food. So this is what I mean that there is a back and forth almost consistently with every other kind of building and food. So agriculture is going to help bring in more food, but it's going to be balanced with the fact that it brings in squalor. And some these buildings here, like this one has plus four public order per turn, this is going to help counter that squalor right the the minus to public order so you want to find that balance and there's going to be some that you can find as well uh, for public order within um, your own uh, ci city center buildings and military buildings and religious buildings so just keep that all in mind when you're when you're building out your provinces uh, the next up we have military buildings so again uh, military buildings are going to be are pretty straightforward they're going to go ahead and they're going to give you access to different kind of units they're going to give you some garrison they're going to give you some benefits um, to the units that you, you recruit there depending on what they are uh, but because, again, you know, the military people are a rank bunch, just bunch, um, they kind of like the more the red light district kind of stuff, and so they're going to give you uh, minus to public order per turn because of squalor. So there's your squalor again. You know, they don't want, there's a lot of uh, significant benefits that you get from military buildings, and so they don't want you having a ton of different military buildings out there, so they're trying to hem that in with squalor. So then the last one is going to be religious buildings, and I don't have any religious buildings in that province, so I want to go ahead and show you over here. I have um, two religious buildings in this province. I have a temple of Zeus. I have a temple of Hermes. And you just they give me different bonuses. So they both have, I think they both have public, yeah, they both have public order. This one gives me commerce. And this one's going to give me Hellenistic culture and security against agents and stuff like that. So that's going to be, they're going to have different benefits like that. Uh, but again, you'll notice that they use food. They take up food. If I want to upgrade this, it's going to ask me for more food. So um, you want to keep all that in mind. Again, the balance between your agriculture buildings and everything else, because you have that fine tune between your research, being whether it's civic or military, and then actually instituting that building and balancing that with your food and your income. So just find all that out um, and fine tune that. But um, along those lines, before I jump into um, squalor and how to summarize all that up, um, a lot of people have been asking me how I like to form my nations. Now, I like to have one uh, province or two or however big my um, empire is growing that are kind of like my bread baskets. So you notice in this one, I'm going to be upgrading uh, this relatively soon to give me plus to food because it's going to be easier for me to manage um, public order in one area, especially if I have my provincial capital, which is kind of focusing on that, which I only just recently conquered all this stuff, so I'm going to go ahead and like probably be demolishing... Um, you know, this military building and stuff, because I don't really want to worry about military here, but I'm going to kind of focus my provincial capital towards happiness um, and public order, and then I'm going to use that surplus I have to kind of balance out the fact that I'm going to get plenty of squalor um, negatives to my public order, because I'm going to be using it for feeding the rest of my empire. And what that's going to allow me to do, it's going to allow me to focus entire provinces like this one um, to doing what I want with it, to being able to expand it and being able to get... Um, 
the kind of buildings that give me money and wealth and my military that I want. So that's going to help like sort all that out. But that's just kind of how I like to do it. It does have a downside that if you do lose those regions, then obviously you are probably going to be in a food shortage and you want to get them back real quickly. But I also find it easier than trying to balance each province being self-sustaining because then you still kind of have that issue because food is you know, uh, empire-wide or faction-wide. So if you lose that one region in that one province, then chances are like the rest of that province is going to want to revolt pretty soon because of the fact that they don't have enough food or maybe it affects the rest of your empire as well. So there's always that issue. But squalor should be seen, uh, moving on to squalor, it should be seen that it is just a negative, another one of your negatives. Now you see I've completely wiped it out here because of the fact that I don't have any um, of the buildings that provide it. Um, so, but you can counter it again with building happiness, with technologies, you can counter it with um, character traits or faction traits, um, you can counter it with edicts, anything that gives plus to your public order. Um, I know a lot of you guys are having trouble to the point where you even have to leave like full stacks of armies um, on regions to be able to repress it, and that's when you need to reorganize what buildings you have in it. Um, the other big problem is a lot of people don't understand that when you expand, if you don't build in it right away, you're going to get slums, and slums provide a pretty hefty negative um, to your uh, public order through squalor. Um, they also give some bonuses, but in my opinion, they're totally not even worth it. But again, that's up to you and if you really like the benefits that come from it. Um, so I usually, when I expand, I want to make sure I already have the money to build a building that I plan to have in that slot. That's probably your best bet that you can do, and that'll help you avoid any of your squalor problems. If you have a hard time, if you have some slums, the way you get rid of them, you hover over them, and then it should say convert or dismantle, um, and it'll say for like your slums, and you can just go ahead and uh, dismantle it, and that'll take a turn. You end the turn, and then you have an empty slot, and then you can go ahead and build in it. So any of you that are having an issue with that and can't figure out how to do it, because I think the slums have a white icon, but again, I, I usually build into it, so I don't really have slums that show up very often. But that's how you counter squalor. The next big thing that people have been uh, having a hard time with is diplomacy, so I'm going to go ahead and jump into that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and use these guys as an example. Um, so a lot of people just don't understand all these different prompts, so I'm going to go ahead and just explain it as I go through. Um, I think they'll be the easiest thing. If you're kind of a, a Total War vet, feel free to skip ahead a couple minutes, because I'm pretty sure you probably already understand this, but again, who knows. Um, so we have obviously payments here, so I can either offer or demand payments um, as part of the deal or just as deals themselves, kind of like as tribute. Then I can um, either ask other people or demand that they break trade agreements. Um, yeah, I can demand or I can offer to break trade agreements or military alliances, non-aggression packs, military access, defensive alliance. Okay. So we can um, ask them to do that or I can offer to do that for myself um, with any of these nations. And that's kind of just to help out how they, uh, to show like, you know, uh, favor towards them. Because I can do this stuff on my own if I wanted to. I can break all these deals alone. But if I do this through um, here, like if I offer to break uh, a military alliance with one of their enemies that they'll say, see me even in better terms than if I just did it on my own. Uh, military access is going to be basically just um, moving, th asking for permission or giving permission to move through territory with units or armies. So um, you'll notice that in other Total War games, if you try to move through enemy territory or just any neutral territory that's not your own, it'll um, tell you either need to get military access or declare war. So you can get armies all the way up to the border, but it won't go, let you go any farther. Well, that's not how it is in Total War Rome 2. You're able to uh, go through any territory you want. There is no like artificial thing stopping you. There's no you know, invisible wall stopping you now telling you with a prompt that you have to do one of these two actions. Um, so what you can you know, what you can do to try to quell um, an issue of, like, you just have no other better way of getting to a territory is to ask for military access. Because if you don't ask for it, it doesn't mean that you're... If you go through some of those territories, it doesn't mean they're going to go to war with you right away, but it's going to insult them, it's going to be a negative. And if you do it enough, then they probably will end up just going to war with you. So if you're having a hard time um, with some of your transportation stuff, get military access. And again, you can always sweeten the deal up with some payments or a trade agreement or whatever if they really want it with you. And that goes on to trade agreements. Trade agreements are pretty straightforward. You can get some benefits to your income through them. Um, it de depends uh, on what you're exporting, um, and then what their what they get is also based on what they are exporting to you. So um, it could be a little bit lopsided um, on the projected value. So I might get a hundred out of this, but I have like wine and stone and all this other stuff and glass and all that stuff to give away, whereas uh, they 
you know, they probably have, yeah, they don't have anything. So they might only get like, you know, 53 gold or whatever out of it. So it's important to remember that one, you know, if they're trying, to, you're trying to make a trade with them, it's like, why would they, you know, give up their, you know, their honor and like how much they dislike you for the fact that they're going to make 53 gold. Like they'd rather just hate you than gain that, you know, pittance amount of money. So the next one we have up is uh, the satrapy, and then we also this would also be replaced with client state. Depends on what kind of faction you play. Uh, I think it's just Pontus and uh, Parthia that are able to make satrapies, but I could be wrong. I know they're only supposed to be eastern ones. I don't know if Egypt is counted to that. I'm sure the Seleucid Empire is going to be counted into that. Um, but there is a difference between the satrapy and the client state. Basically, um, as an overall thing, these are basically saying that you're going to allow them a certain amount of uh, autonomy to your empire, but they're going to be considered part of your territory, and they're going to give you tribute from part of their income, um, and I believe also they might give you a unit as well um, every now and again um, if they are a satrapy. But I could be wrong on that. Don't quote me. But um, satrapies are different than client states because client states are still able to declare war on other countries they're basically kind of just like you are under our protection and our watch and our guide uh, our guide whereas uh, satrapy the only thing they can do is make trade agreements with um, anyone and then they can also declare war only on their master so only on the nation that rules over them that they are a satrapy to so client states can make trade agreements and military access and all that other stuff um, but they just can't you know they they're not uh, able to do a lot of the same things that they uh, could if they were on their own. Now obviously we have declare of war. You can do this uh, through here. It's always going to prompt you to come through here and declare war. Um, but you know you can just do it you know now if I wanted to, but I don't. So um, then we can offer to join war against um, or offer or demand that they join war against certain people. So this is good for um, your allies and stuff like that. And then this is um, you're also going to get a prompt when you have allies to give them. Um, war targets so you can tell them to attack certain armies or certain provinces or whatever and then non-aggression pack is basically um, there's no alliance um, you're just saying I'm not gonna attack you you're not gonna attack me pretty simple stuff basically you know just hey we'll leave each other alone um, I also want to go over defensive alliance and military alliance defensive alliance is that you only come to each other's aid when um, when you have somebody attacking you if you instigate the war or your ally instigates the war, then you are not liable to go ahead, to go ahead and have to defend them. Um, it is up to them. But if they get attacked by somebody, then you have to come to their aid. Whereas a military alliance, this one requires that it doesn't matter if they go to war or you know they declare the war or the war is declared on them. Um, in the end, you have to support them. So that is what you're agreeing to. So that's kind of the differences between non-aggression pact, defensive war, and uh, full-blown military alliance. And then, of course, I guess you can kind of tack onto that, you know, being a satrapy or being a client state. But that kind of summarizes all the diplomacy. And then lastly, I want to kind of go over culture because a lot of people have also been having issues with culture. This is just one of the another negative factors or positive factors um, going into your public order details. So culture is going to be something that is dependent on the factions that you've conquered things from. And then it's also going to be based on the geography in general. So... If I were to look uh, here, this area is kind of like a Celtic culture, um, oddly enough. And then I'm considered more of a Hellenistic culture. And so when I expand out into here, I'm going to be running more into an Eastern culture. Um, and the way you counter this is there are certain buildings, characters, that kind of stuff. Um, they all have different cultural influences that help expand um, and bring all this uh, into the, you know, bring people into the fold uh, through your nation. So. Uh, that's kind of how you counter it. Obviously, it is still just um, a public order issue, so you can counter it with a bunch of other stuff. You can counter it with technologies and buildings. Uh, you can counter it with you know characters again, just giving pluses to public order. Um, you can counter it with uh, putting armies on on top of them, to, on top of the buildings, to try to uh, you know quell them with plus the public order. So that's really how you have to balance it. It's just another negative thing, just another thing to kind of like hem you in and make it to where you can't just like expand, 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 expand. If you're like really good at, at battles, you have to still like kind of consolidate every now and again. It's going to try to like hem you in a bit. So, but that's, that's really all you need to know about culture. But, um, so this is going to go ahead and end my part two for province management. I feel like I've touched on pretty much everything you guys have mentioned. If there's anything that I still haven't touched on, you just let me know and I'll see if I can just answer it um, in messages. If I get enough of it, then I guess I'll make a part three. I really just want to try to touch on everything that you guys are concerned about. Um, and again, if you guys have any questions about other parts of the game, um, I'll 
going to be trying to make guides just to answer your guys' uh, thoughts and on you know what you want to know. So feel free. This is all based on what you guys have been giving me as feedback. So I hope you guys really enjoyed this. You know, please like and subscribe if you did. It really means a lot. I put a lot of effort into this content. And um, until next time, I'll see you later.